Welcome to the, this wonderful session, and I think you're too, very motivated because this is Saturday morning, and usually probably if I was you, I may not come, but uh, uh, so the goal here today is to talk about cancer survivorship, and it's really not just about cancer, but any type of disease. So I myself is a two-time cancer survivor. Uh, I had uh, pre-leukemia. I also have, like, sarcoma, and, you know, you don't want a cancer, but sometimes, you know, life is part, cancer is part of your life. But uh, I want to talk about today about empowerment, actually, and empowerment about how do you engage yourself in, uh, in the healthcare setting, right? So all of you have mostly some kind of insurance or some way to get your health, and you go to either Queens, HPH, or Quakini, or Adventist, or Kaiser, it's probably one of them, actually, most likely, okay? So we have challenges because, you know, the doctor's healthcare provider is the people that you have to deal with. I'm not just talking about doctors, but a variety of people who's reaching out to you. So the ultimate lead that what we really want is high-quality medical care, and, you know, and what is high-quality medical care? And you have to ask yourself, what, what is it, right? And so it's really about, uh, for, from the, our side, so I'm just wearing my hat as not as a patient, but a healthcare provider, the patient will have a highly satisfactory medical care delivery that can live their lives, uh, lives with in their own way. I mean, does that make sense? You know, you could have whatever treatment, but if your quality of life is damaged, and if you can't do what you want to do, it doesn't really make sense. And, and cancer has a tendency to do that, because we could be, as a medical oncologist, I could provide you chemotherapy if it's necessary, but it could really damage, and suddenly cancer becomes center of your life, and it becomes challenging. It's not only you getting challenged, but your entire family is going to get impacted. So regardless of the type of the disease, cancer or not cancer, you want to have really a high quality of life through the treatment. So we have lots of different doctors who's going to help you to really come up the best outcome. And we call it multidisciplinary care. So it means that if it's cancer, the surgeon have to work, surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, pathologist, radiologist, rehab, social worker, everybody has to work together. So the question is, what is, you know, team approach? And, and, uh, and I'm just going to give you our perspective, not your perspective. From you, you can only see doctor's name, and they may give you a name card, or they will give you a list, and then by the moment you leave the office, you don't even remember our name. Is uh, the, the reality that we face, but... Uh, uh, you're laughing, but sometimes I go to the doctor and I can't even remember my name. And the office calls me and I say, who are you, actually? <laughs> I've done this a couple times, even for my doctors, actually. And, and, uh, but ultimately, for our end, we want to give you coordinated treatment and care. You know, taking in account with your need is what we call the team approach. Now, you know, how do we make decision? Okay, so we're not, you know, you may think there's a cookbook, right, you know, in healthcare. And a lot of you probably say that there must be black and white, and, you know, to do this and you shouldn't do that. Well, healthcare is not black and white. It's pretty much gray. And this is where the challenge comes in. Because if it's ultimately you have to get it, you know, if they don't do it, you should sue them, actually. Okay? And if they do things that wrong, you know, uh, if they do things wrong, you should sue them. But it's difficult to really take a help, you know, action to the doctors. Well, that's because everything is fuzzy, actually. And each of your cases is different. We need to think about your need, and we have to apply science to that. But science is not always the answer, because it's a kind of a catchball between you and ourselves to understand how can we provide the best care. So this is where team approach is needed because if you have one person making your decision, the chance of making a mistake is extremely high. So we try to work together. Okay, so 
what's the difference, you know, with like a university setting and a small clinic? The difference is not the type of the drug you have or the type of the technology you have. These days, the difference is how well you could do the team approach. Because if you go to a bigger center, you may have more different people talking to each other, and they could have a difference in opinion. And when we have difference in opinion, we never tell you there's a difference in opinion. Okay? Well, we don't tell you. Because if I give you the difference in opinion and lay this out, you're going to be confused. Our job is to try to make the best decision by having a discussion. You don't, you know, if I was a patient, I don't want to hear what I'm talking about. It's, 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 I mean, sometimes it's black and white, it's easy, right? I mean, but so, but like in cancer, the complicated case requires discussion. And it sounds like, okay, I want to be, I'm the patient, I want to listen to it. But if you listen to those things, you're just going to get confused. So our job is to really provide you. And then you ask questions, and you could say, like, you know, why did you do this? And, and we'll tell you the discussion sometimes. But our goal is for you to understand Right? So if you don't understand, it makes it difficult. And ultimately, our job from our end is to have this discussion to be published and to become com common knowledge. Part is research. Part is not just research, but how we operate the healthcare system. So that's what's going on with these major uh, health systems. They're trying to come up with the best team approach for whatever care that we have to provide. So, so the goal of the multidisciplinary care or team approach is ultimately patient satisfaction. We always talk about we want to improve your satisfaction. So, so what is you know um, you know um, for what is our goal? You know, healthcare provider goal. So we want to provide you high quality of care. We want to improve the quality of care because that's what you're going to be getting, and we want to empower you. Okay, so we don't commonly talk about patient coming to the center, but it is our job for the healthcare side to say that, you know, how can we empower you? And then from our side, healthcare side, you may not know this, but you know, before COVID, roughly in the U.S., 60% of the healthcare provider has a burnout. Okay, it's, it, you know, the reason is patient complaints. No, that's not the reason, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the reason is there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of, uh, you know, coordination needed, and a lot of different demands. And so we want healthcare provider to be happy, right? So, so the, our goal is to create a resilient healthcare provider. It's not that we're, our work is never going to go down. You know, some of the healthcare providers said, let's reduce the number of the patient. Well, it's not going to happen. It's a reality that, that, you know, we have to do and we have to take care of. But we want healthcare provider that's resi resilient, you know, strong and able to deal with stress. And because happy doctors or happy nurses will get you high quality of the care. So that's what we're tackling. So we... You know, our flow from the healthcare side is, you know, define our team members, you know, define the patient and who is a caregiver. We always want to know the dynamic of the family or the friends who you have. And then we try to provide patient-centered multidisciplinary care, which result in improvement of outcome and safety. And then this provide patient satisfaction. Ultimately, we will be satisfied. So if we're not satisfied with your outcome, most people will burn out. And that's exactly what happened during pandemic. Pandemic was challenging because of virus impacting you know, the senior resident and many of the people who are immune system is low, but it's been challenging because it re depleted our resource and that resulted into burnout. So you know what's happening now is we are losing a lot of, particularly the nurses, you know, they don't, they don't say, they're saying like, why do I have to do it nursing anymore? It just take my energy. It's, you know, I'm getting unhealthy type of thing. So we're having a difficulty retaining healthcare provider to work in the mainland. And similar thing is happening here. It's difficult to retain good people to stay in this business. So the question becomes, you know, like I keep saying that, what is satisfaction? What is satisfaction for you? Okay, so 
you know, we all agree with the first one, right? We want to have an improvement. And if it's cancer, you may say cure. If you can't cure the disease, some chronic disease like hypertension, you can't cure it, but it want to be controlled. You want improvement of any part of health challenge. And in that process, we want to make sure that you have high quality of uh, life. Uh, so QOL is extremely important. So yes, we are trying to address one and two, uh, but there's no guarantee, right? And that's where the, when you have a discussion with your doctor, you know, you, some doctors will never say, the surgeon loves to say that, okay, we take it out and it's, oh, everything is taken care of. Internal medicine doctor generally is not very committal, right? You probably notice that, well, probably you'll be fine type of thing. You know, you heard these things, right? What, we, we, I mean, you know, I do the same thing, probably. I, I don't say that your cancer is going to be cured. I will never say that. Okay, because I don't have that confidence. I don't have that evidence, okay, and I can't predict the future. I'll do my best to do what's the best for you, but I can't predict the outcome. But one of the things that whether you're ultimately, you know, happy or not happy is, do you understand what I'm saying is really the thing? So what happened is that when you go to office, it's like, God, that doc, I have no idea what he was saying, you know. Or, or the, and the doc and the nurse is telling you two different things. What's going on, something? And then you go back at home and you talk to your daughter or son and say, like, first, it gets things confusing. By that time, you're just complaining about, not about the option that you were giving. You're pretty much complaining because I have no idea what I'm going through at this moment. So... High-level understanding is extremely important. Not the outcome. It's actually the understanding is very important. If you don't understand, generally, you're not happy about it. So different people, you know, and there's pharmacists, nurses, physician, social worker, multiple things like in cancer, they work. And then we are all focused on satisfaction. So how do we get this, you know, particularly understanding and, and, and going through this? Well, this is what we call patient empowerment, okay? So we like to empower you, and we like for you to be an empowered patient, or if you're not a patient, empowered individual, you know, accessing the health care. So what is empowerment? is the question we have to do. So there is actually a definition from the WHO, World Health Organization. So this uh, empowerment is a process uh, through which people gain greater control over decision and actions affecting their health. It's not me. I will give you option. I will give you recommendation. But you are in the driver's seat. You will make a decision with us. Now, this is not about this, okay? I'm just going to give you an example. Some people think this empowerment is a, uh, in a different way. Um, it's not like I, you come to me and I say, I'll give you option A, option B, and option C, and then pick your favorite, okay? Uh, there's some doc who does that, actually, which is a problem, okay? Because it, and. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about, decision-making. It is really about understanding, and then you feel like we made a decision together to say that this is best for me, okay? And, and, and so that means that you need to understand what's going on, right? You need to understand about the disease. You need to understand about the treatment or process or whatever you're going to be doing. So... You have to know, as a patient, what is your role, okay? Sometimes you feel like there's no role. I mean, you feel like, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like a fish and the chef is just cooking, you know, without... But that's not what we're talking about here. You are part of the healthcare team. You're part of it, and you have to understand, you know, what your role is, okay? Second is you have to have a sufficient knowledge to be able to engage with a healthcare provider, right? So you watch, you know, these TV drama, medical drama. You love it. Some of you probably love it, right? You love it because you have no idea what they're saying, actually. And, you know, we give you all these medical lingos, and it sounds like very, like, doctor-like talk. But that's not what real reality is. Here, you know, we need for you to get certain knowledge. So what we're talking, you could understand. But 
And it sounds like you went to a doctor because you don't understand what you're saying because they use all these medical lingos, actually. But that's not what we're talking about here. And then it's a skill set that I want you to have. You know, how do you gain your knowledge? How do you really understand, you know, what you do? So that's really, you know, for creating this environment. And that's what this empowerment is about. So my, our healthcare side goal is to empower you, okay? And then um, your goal is to become an empowered patient, okay? So what is patient competence? Well, patient's attitude of accepting his or her illness as his own, her own, and then not leaving it to healthcare provider. So it is our job, but it is also your job to, to, in, to be engaged and acquire various kind of knowledge and then building the relationship of trust, okay? So sometimes this communication collapses because there is no trust. So what is this about? Okay, well, you, you know that, you know, uh, this is Hawaii, so you go to this Japanese restaurant, you hear omakase, right? Okay, that is terrible, okay? You don't want to do omakase in the, in the medical, okay? I mean, omakase, you know what, you know, you know, you know what that means in Japanese, literally. It means that the chef will cook you, actually. <laughs> That's what it means, okay? Omakase means that you don't know what you're going to get. You pay 100 bucks, and then you'll get something that you don't even know that you ordered. Okay, that's not what the health care is. So in Japanese, actually, they call it omakase patient, actually. And they exist a lot, you know. You know they ask, like, okay, doc, please take care of me. That's the last thing you want to tell the doc, okay? They, you are part of it because if you let the doctor just, or healthcare provider do whatever they is, it's omakase style. It sounds really nice, but basically you're not engaged, okay? So, so we want to change that. You, we have to have a flat relationship with a healthcare provider. So it's about having leadership in your life even if you have cancer or any kind of serious disease. Now, of course, if you have just a simple cold, you don't have, you, you want to do omakase, that's fine with me, okay? <laughs> but, but you don't want to do that for cancer or serious heart disease or stroke, okay? That's not omakase style, okay? So low patient empowerment, who are they, okay? And including myself when I had cancer, I myself, okay, despite I'm talking this way, I could easily was one of those low patient empowerment. So one is do not or cannot ask questions, okay? You go to your doc and you nod your heads, you look like you're listening, but you're not listening, and you keep nodding your head, and then bye-bye, <laughs> okay? Uh, do not know or do not want to know about his or her illness. So, you know, some people, some of you may like to look internet, but some people even don't look it up and they don't even know their illness. So, you know, what, what kind of cancer do you have? Well, I think I have some kind of breast cancer, but I'm not quite sure what drug I'm taking, and, I, and I'm supposed to cut now's it. I mean, that's really terrible, right? And then you go to like you know Google, or and you start searching it, and you start buying you know mushroom or whatever like a superpower juice or whatever that is, and then uh, and then they and literally you you can't tell what's from the the fake from not fake actually. And then leave it up to us, omakase style. That's what we're talking about, low patient empowerment. So have you ever heard like these things? Okay, you know, Mr. A, he's not a, you know, for us, you know, he's not very good at understanding. So this conversation happens in the clinic quite often. God, that patient doesn't understand what, they're, what, what I'm talking about. I mean, he must be just nodding his head. Mr. B went to alternative medicine, but... And we tried to explain, but it's like absolutely they're not listening to me, and there seems to be no way to other to help him. So should we, like, okay, well, let him do whatever, you know. I mean, he has his own way. I mean, this is a conversation, this is a true conversation that happens in our here, okay? <laughs> Just letting you know, okay? Uh, uh, Mr. C, uh, Mr. C or Mrs. C always leave it up to the medical profession, 
but I really wonder if that's the right things to do, you know. So, so you know, you see this omakase, it's like, Doc, you're really great, thank you very much, you know. And all the nice thing happens, but in like in our bed, like, is this really right? Is she understanding? And, and we get nervous about it. So, um, so from us, you know, when these conversation happens, you know, there are two type of, do- you know, doctors. I mean, it's because they're so busy, it's like, okay, just let it go, you know. We'll see how it goes, type of thing. Versus what we need to do something about it. So we keep asking ourselves that shouldn't we be more involved actively to try to empower our patient, continues to remain in ourselves. So we do have issue on our side also, okay, uh, so you have many specialty doctors, right? So it could be breast cancer specialty, whatever cancer, or it could be cardiology. You probably notice that some people don't look you as a, as a person, but they're more focused on about the disease. So your conversation is more transactional type of thing. And that's one issue, okay? And when you have a conversation, they're not listening to you. You try to explain to them, but, and they seem to be very busy, and they're focused on treatment A, treatment B type of thing, rather than what your need is, okay? And then, and they may not even know who you are, and they don't even know your background, so there's a tendency to become very transactional, right? So, so we do have this type of people, and, and even myself, I could fall into that category very easily if the situation is very busy. If you have 20 patients, and if you have 30 patients, I see here, like in Hawaii, because the volume is much more higher, sometimes in cancer, you end up doing three minutes or five minutes visit. And it's like, you know, I'm shaking my head, and it's like, oh my God. But it's a reality that we're facing at this moment. And so this is not saying that the one doctor is good from, the, you know, from best. The longer doctor doesn't mean they're good. But what I'm trying to say is, are you really understanding where you stand? And that transaction, whatever you have, is it satisfactory enough? Okay. So the outcome of who people are not engaged and if the healthcare provider is not truly, um, you know, engaged from our end is one, it declines the quality of healthcare. The compliance have a tendency to go down. You know, how many times I give you medication and you don't even swallow the pills or even don't, you don't even go to the long pharmacy. Yes, we do know that you're not taking the medicine, okay? I don't say it sometimes, but, uh, you know, but I do ask, like, you know, did you really take a dog? And they said not, but uh, somehow the count doesn't match with the pharmacy. I mean, you, you know, they're all electronically connected. So, so don't, I would probably not lie to the doctors, okay? Uh, the other is mistake, okay? So please remember, we make mistake, okay? Absolutely, we will make mistake, okay? Uh, we should not make a mistake. I mean, that's another statement, but we do make mistake. So if you don't think things are not right or something doesn't make sense, if you don't speak up, the chance of making that mistake is even higher, okay? And then ultimately, it's about medical knowledge advancement. So if you are passive, yes. Well, we just let it go. It doesn't go. So the, the story I always give is about sushi restaurant. We talk about omakase, OK? Uh, so if you're a customer and I'm the sushi chef, OK, if you don't know the taste of uh, you know, the high quality fish, why do I have to give you high quality fish? Well, I don't do that as a physician. <laughs> but, you know, five days old, they'll say, it's good, that's great. But if you are a consumer who pay attention and you know the fish, it will make me nervous, right, as a sushi chef. It's the same thing. If you don't ask questions, if you don't engage, you're not putting, you're not putting pressure on me. So it's important that the, to improve the quality of the care, your engagement is very important. Okay, so, oops, how can I go back? Sorry about that. Okay, so high pay, you know, empower patient is up the opposite end. 
They're willing to ask questions, understand where they stand. They have a high level of health literacy, meaning that they, they could do some great Google search, okay, participate in care and treatment. And if there's opportunity for clinical trial, they are more likely to participate. Okay, so patients do need to learn the patient empowerment process. Uh, it is our job to empower you, but you also need to really uh, be, uh, to be empowered. So there are three skills I want you to take home today. Okay, and skills mean that if you don't have it, you can learn uh, education and training. So it's called the MAC. Uh, M stands for medical literacy, second is assertiveness, and three is communications, okay? So let's talk about medical literacy, okay? So medical literacy is really about to understand and examine, apply information, okay? So wh what are we talking about, okay? Well, you know, from the patient needs, I want the content to be easy to understand, right? And I want to understand the content. So it's really about, from our end, we may provide you use medical lingo, okay? So, and they may just keep talking. I mean, even myself, I have a tendency to just keep talking and talking to my patient. It is your job to say that, doc, I don't understand what you're saying. Don't nod your, please do not nod your head if you don't understand, okay? Please. Because if you nod your head, I believe that you're understanding. I am not going to ask you, are you really understanding? Well, it has happened once in a while because, uh, because a patient falls asleep in front of me. So, so, but, uh, so if you don't understand, you should ask, okay? And there are different techniques that we could provide for information. You could ask them to write it out, or you could ask using diagram. You could ask all these questions. So documenting is very important. It's important that your family member goes with you. I get nervous when the patient just come by themselves because if I say that, hey, it seems like a cancer is a little bit getting you know, big, in the moment, the, the brain is completely like fighting out and, and, and after that, they're not listening to me at all. So you need another person to, you know, uh, to try to really understand you know, what, what's going on, okay? So medical literacy is really about ability to find the good stuff and ability to determine the truth. And this is the question that, you know, we want all of you to have, actually. So what is this about? The first thing I want you to understand that everything that we have in medicine, okay, has a benefit and risk. And when the benefit for you is high, we try to provide that treatment. If the risk is too high, the tendency is that we will not give it to you. So why am I talking about this? Okay, so you go to internet, and this is like, it worked in 100%, no side effect. Well, first, automatically, that's fake, okay? And it happened with particular like uh, vitamin, nutrition, those kind of things. You know, it has, has a lot of things, okay? So evidence, okay, we go by what we call EBM, evidence-based medicine. So, and, and I'm talking about Western medicine, but we have a low quality evidence from high quality evidence. Low quality is usually high bias, and high quality is low bias. So if somebody says that your treatment is based on national guideline, and this is what we should be doing, that means that very likely that they're following the highest quality of care to you. So you could ask like, Doc, you know, is this based on a certain type of guideline? And they say, yeah, this is what it is. And they may say, like, well, it's not following the guideline, but I'm giving you this ABC reason that we're going to be doing this. So that makes sense. Now, the worst is, according to my experience, I done this, gave it this drug and it shrunk the tumor. My experience is, is sometimes good, but sometimes it's only like one or two cases. That is no guarantee. You have to remember that one person experience or newspaper say breakthrough treatment, you have no idea whether that is high quality or not. So you have to be careful about these like, you know, news outlet or doctors saying like, you know, according to my experience, this works real well. That is potentially biased, okay? 
The other is internet. Okay, so when you search for technical terms and common names, there are one thing I want you to remember. Okay, so for example, medication. Okay, please always search with product name and generic name. Okay, because the information you get is different. So you may, some of you may know this chemotherapy called Taxol. Okay, so it's used for breast cancer. That's fine, it's a product name, but the generic is Pacutaxel. So every drug has a product commercial name. Okay, so you t watch TV and you see this drug co commercial, right? But, and then the generic, generic name, okay, that scientific name is small. Because most of us on the healthcare side, we don't use product name. That's really for commercialization. So when you got, if you want to get a lot of information on drug, you want to make sure that you put both names to search. Now, if you have a diagnosis, you want to know the scientific diagnosis and the common diagnosis, like cold. Okay, cold is not what we, you know, it's not a scientific. We, you know, our board exam doesn't say that, how do you treat cold? Okay, they, they, you don't see that kind of thing. They'll say like, you know, RSV, upper respiratory infection, or something like that. And then you get, so, so you should ask your doctor, what is the scientific name or the formal name? And then the information you get is also different. And, you know, and, and try to, you know, uh, learn how to do online searches. And if you don't know, okay, so this is what I suggest. You know, if you see something great and um, you're excited about it, that's fine. I encourage all people to go to the net and look at But print out the first page, okay, and then show it to your doctors. Like, what do you think about this, okay? And then, well, first, if they don't want to do it, the, the doctor doesn't want to do it, then you may probably, you should fire that doctor. But, uh, but uh, anyway, so just show it to them, and I will say that you like it, I, this is good or bad. And you'll get a sense that what are we going to say, good or bad. Or you could ask them that, what is a, the, the website that I should be going to learn? So that's a catch ball that you have to do with your healthcare provider, which is really helpful. What I don't want you to do is that, yes, there are some times that they go to the supplement side and they page, pay, print me a doc, there's 30 pages, and I want you to read about this. And I'll say, like, I'm sorry, I don't have the time to read 30 pages. So just be mindful about time, but I think you should try not to hide. The worst is you're listening, and in a secretly behind the scene, you're doing Google search, and then you're making a decision, and you're not sharing what you're looking up. And this has happened multiple times, that the doctor is understanding on the something on surface and you are on completely different end because you're reading something that's not correct or right. Now sometimes they read the right thing and then they, they even become smarter and they ask very sharp questions. So th that's how the, the search should be done. And then the assertiveness, okay? So, Assertiveness is about express your thoughts and feeling. So once again, we talked about this. You know, you nod your head, but you don't really express what, how you feel. So, you know, when I want to choose my treatment, or I want to tell what I want. Okay, so this is about your value, okay, or your work history, your hobbies, okay. If you don't tell me what your, what your lifestyle is, particularly like cancer treatment or stroke treatment or MI, we will just do a cookie cutter approach. But if you say, I need to play piano or I have to go to work, you know, that background story really help us to, you know, personalize a treatment. Because we have some basic things we have to do, but if you don't tell me, we'll just do whatever. We don't care about your schedule type of thing. So really expressing your opinion or how you feel, like, you know, I don't like chemotherapy or I don't like this on a regular basis is very important. Now, the only risk is, okay, I'm just going to inform you that you need to do this on a regular basis. So what happened, like, in cancer treatment, you say, I absolutely don't like chemotherapy. I'm not going to take it. And then we agree we're not going to do it. And later on, they change the mind, but they don't tell you. So in, we're like, okay, this person will absolutely not going to take chemotherapy, so we're not going to give that treatment. So you, 
your value continues to change, right? Because you may be working or not working. Those kind of value needs to be constantly given to the, the physicians. And, and most docs will not ask. So it is your job to tell, you know, what's going on with your life. Okay, and communications. Okay, so if the docs or healthcare provider is rushing, you need to tell that you're rushing, okay? You need to put that stop. Uh, yes, even myself, I get rushed and because we don't have time, okay? So try to be proactive about the speed. You're in control. Uh, if they are very busy and they seem like they can't have time to talk, you should ask, when do you have time to talk with me? Can we set another time to go over this? And you should ask. And they should tell you that, yes, okay, seems like you're not understanding. Let's find a time to speak 15, 20 minutes at this time or I'll call you later, okay? Uh, they sometimes will offer you. So I may offer because generally I pay attention to these things, but sometimes I don't pay attention and, and you tell me and then I will set up a time actually. So, so it's, you should tell about this. And then you should ask for, can I record it or videotape it, okay? Uh, don't secretly record, please, okay? Uh, there, it has happened. It's not common. Gen generally, but if the healthcare provider said, I, you cannot record, there is a serious issue, okay? I'm just letting you know. You, it, this conversation is nothing secret, and you, are, you have every right for your medical record. You have every right for recording, okay? Now, videotaping is a little bit tricky, you know, and I, I generally okay it because, you know, sometimes a family can come and you do FaceTime or Zoom and, you know, they join. I, I really don't care. But then when you have your camera in your face, it's like, <laughs> you know, sometimes it does make nervous. But I think some people even allow it. But minimally, you know, voice recording is okay. Okay. So we talk about this empowerment, okay, you know, um, it's really about, you know, the starting from uh, M and A and C, and these are skills that you have to really learn from it. Now, the reality is most patients don't have this skill. If I, when I was a cancer patient, well, I'm still, you know, having different health issues, uh, I have a tendency to fall in that I don't want to ask the doctors, you know, I don't want to bother them. I feel bad about it. They're, I know they're busy. You know, you, you must feel like that sometimes, right? I, they look very busy. So I, say, I don't want to bother them. That's, that's a crap, okay? <laughs> so, 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 so it is, you're in the driver's seat. You do what you need to do, okay? So, so I want to talk about environment, okay? And environment is not, you know, something that you could create, but ultimately that you want physician who's going to look your eye, okay? If you have a doctor who's not, you know, looking at you, there is some concern, okay? And if they're not smiling, you know, that, that is also a problem. If they don't offer a hand, there's an issue, and there's no encouragement. Even in the most difficult situation with no answer, you know, there's, we need to encourage. You know, I take care of patients that they're having end-of-life issue, but I am here to really, you know, tackle this with you together, and I will walk with you together. And it doesn't mean that I have a solution, but, you know, as a physician, it is my duty to really try to get through the process as much as possible, okay? And, you know, deep insight and reflections, that is the kind of relationship you want to have with a healthcare team. But it goes both ways. You know, this is not something that you, it's easily to create, but empower patient has more likely to, you know, it will resonate on our side and we will make a difference, okay? Like, you don't want to have omakase healthcare, okay? Okay, so this is what we call about empathy. Okay, so empathy is ability to understand patients' internal experience, thoughts, and concern, and to share and communicate with understanding with the patients. 
And higher the primary physician empathy score, the better patient's clinical outcome is. Now, you can't, you know, make me empathetic. I mean, it's not something you teach. It's, it's all about relationship, right? So we all know that we need to provide compassionate care, empathetic care. That's the medical school teach. Jackson constantly probably talk about it. And it, we could look as a skill, but ultimately this empathy and compassionate care and the balance between the environment we talk about is because you are there and you're able to engage. Okay. So I want to finish with a couple of things, okay? So how do we make our clinical decision, okay, as a, as a doctor or healthcare provider? How do I make a decision for you to provide this treatment or no treatment or care? Well, one is evidence, right? Because that's why we have research. The Cancer Center work on variety of cancer-related research, and we create clinical trials and research. We have our expertise, right? So we have now at the Cancer Center highly specialized academic care, and our goal of the Cancer Center is that you don't have to leave the island, and all highly specialized care could be done on the island, okay? And that's what we're building here. You have good cancer doctors out there, but academic side could provide more expertise so that you don't have to go to MD Anderson. So I came from MD Anderson, but uh, you don't have to go to UCSF or Stanford. I mean, there are certain t type of cancer that we have a same level of care here, and you don't have to leave the island. But ultimately, our decision-making of what kind of care we provide is based on your value, okay? So how do you want to live? What kind of work you do? You know, what's your family? Your value is very important, and that is totality of collective decision-making that we do. So we talk about MAC. This you know, decision-making is influenced based on how much you understand what's going on, how much you're willing to share your emotion or your need, okay? And then your willingness to communicate with a healthcare provider. So now you can see that when you go to clinic and you don't say anything and the doctor is just talking five minutes and bye-bye, that is a high-risk situation is what I'm trying to say. And of course, one visit, there's no effect. But we've seen this sometimes that it, things are accumulate so much. So that's probably the biggest challenge we have on the island. And if you go to like a large medical center in the mainland, you feel like, oh, I got so much about it. Well, that's because more likely that if you go to mainland in a large center, they'll spend plenty of time and try to listen to you. They're not maybe no difference in their, what they're providing, but the way they, the, the mannerism of a bedside, you know, uh, how we communicate is slightly different. And so this is where the burnout of healthcare provider needs to be addressed. So this, you know, total thing will determine. So if you look from uh, the best care, evidence-based medicine, multidisciplinary care team approach, and patient competence is what we're looking for. And, and you are in the driving seat, and we are responsible to make sure that you become competent. And then if you feel like you, don't, you lack your skill, you ask us. But if, the, if the, the healthcare provider is not very empowering to you, you need to start thinking, is this the right doc or the right team that you should be tackling with? Okay. Okay, so to the healthcare provider, this is what I always say, we should provide a platform to learn and deepen the necessary knowledge and skill. We should do work, you know, workshop and case conferences and, and try to really, you know, publish this so that we could empower our patients. To the community, you know, we want you to raise awareness about the importance of patient empowerment or competence. And, and we, you know, as a cancer center, we try to outreach, we do social media, government and administrative agency is working on this. But ultimately, those are just really part of it. It's about really you, is what I'm saying. So in summary, patient competence refers to the attitude of the patient who see, 
uh, his, who sees his her illness as his own issues and builds a good relationship with a healthcare provider and tries to live life positively. And that's what we like to see. And three important skills of MAC are necessary for cancer patient, or it doesn't have to be cancer, but any uh, health, any people who have certain type of health issues. And you or we should empower the patients by facilitating the environment with empathy. Okay, so I just want to end with this phrase from, uh, it's a Japanese phrase, but you know, you want to conquer, some people want to like win, win, you know, conquer the cancer, win the cancer, eliminate the cancer. It's really a nice, you know, uh, a model or kind of aspiration. But ultimately, if you're going to win or, be, you know, be happy, is not about winning over the disease. It's winning over yourself, actually. It's really about you, not the disease. Uh, disease, we like, we will do our best to give you the best outcome, but ultimately, it is about what's your value and how you live well. And that's what healthcare is about. So uh, thank you for listening, and uh, ho uh, this is a program that I've been doing for a long time. So, okay, that's it. Dr. Ueno, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We do have a few minutes for questions. Any questions from our in-person audience? And online audience, don't forget to type into the chat. Hi, thank you so much, that was excellent. Um, I have a question that I hope isn't inappropriate. Uh, my best friend died of cancer a year ago, and I want to understand what was going on in our the nation's medical system. She was diagnosed in 2021, which was in the middle of COVID, and she is a very low uh, patient empowerment person. They don't have computer. And uh, one of her team members, one of the doctors, told her she needed to have surgery right away. And then seven months passed, and she didn't have surgery. And then later on, uh, her primary oncologist told her she might have lung involvement, and she really needed that exam, but then weeks and weeks went by and that didn't happen. So I'm just wondering if something was going on with everyone in the medical community that these things could not happen. Yeah. So we hear those type of stories. So the story is that uh, you have a patient was, you know, you were told that this will happen and most likely there's multiple healthcare provider here. So one of the challenges on Hawaii is that we have experts in different uh, point of area, but sometimes the coordinated care doesn't happen because it's not under the one wing, actually. You have five different major healthcare system, and then they're you know, sometimes competing, and then they're not always communicating, uh, and, and it is a problem. So this is one of the things that you have to remember, that if you have cancer, you really have to sometimes take the lead by yourself for navigation type of thing. Uh, there is an effort from the cancer center to work with a healthcare provider to bring what we call the navigator. It's they don't really treat you, but really navigate the process type of thing. But unfortunately, this is a building phase at this moment, so I'm not going to say that it's easily accessible at this moment. But any kind of cancer generally will require a team. So the question you could ask to your doctor is that if you have a certain type of cancer, or it doesn't have to be cancer, who are the team that you, we have to engage to get the best outcome? They may say surgeon or radiation oncologist or medical oncologist, or if it's a heart attack, they may say cardiologist rehab or internal medicine or endocrine. Just up front ask them what they need, okay? And then who should be the team player? Okay, and I would like to say that they'll contact the doc. So I already experienced here that they won't contact actually. So I end up picking the phone, you know, as a patient, like, you know, uh, when can I get an appointment? And then, and you find out the state, and then the other date doesn't match up. And so I call the other doc, said, well, they're not giving appointment, or it's not matching up, so what are we going to do type of thing? So 
I mean, you know, even me at my position, I, I can't get an appointment actually. <laughs> and and uh, you know, you think that it was my position, they should listen to me, but they don't listen to me. <laughs> so, so that, that's a challenge. It is a challenge. I'm just not going to deny about it. I'm willing, I'm here to change that system. But this is what I want you to ask that who is need to be involved for your best care, right? And then they'll tell you it's a specialty. And then you could ask, like, who is the doctor that you're going to refer to me? And then if things are not moving, unfortunately, what you could do pragmatically is start making phone call and it's like, what's going on type of thing. And, and if it's not truly satisfactory, you should even go to the patient advocacy of the healthcare system that I'm not happy with uh, how the coordination is done. And that will bring, uh, you know, attention to it. And then uh, the, the key word is risk management. You know, the healthcare is really nervous about having a risk situation. So if you're really unhappy, you call the patient advocacy or whatever in the hospital said, I'm really not happy with the coordination and this is a really, you know, poor quality, high risk situation. Can you help me? I mean, don't, don't be angry about it, okay? If, they get, if you are angry, they'll get angry. It doesn't help. But just, you know, you should put a pressure. You should pressure to the healthcare and you should pressure me, okay? That's your job, actually. And unfortunately, that's what it takes. I'll, and then by doing this, the quality of the care will generally improve in Hawaii. I have a comment from an online participant. Excellent presentation, giving patients skills and empowerment with their health care uh, and other aspects of life. So thank you. I know that to answer the question, for my family members and very close friends, I'm often their health care navigator. So if you know somebody, if you have a family member in the healthcare field or a good friend, use them, because that can really help you a lot. Yeah, that's a good, good point, because you may find a nurse where, you know, sometimes health, some kind of healthcare, they know how to navigate, right? And, then, uh, and I think Hawaii needs more navigator. We really need to invest in this area. It's not about the doctor's expertise, and that will really make a difference uh, in this area. Dr. Ueno, just for your information, there are a bunch of uh, programs training community health workers mm -hmm. that are part of, the, uh, they belong to the ethnic groups of the communities that they serve, and we are trying to improve at least geriatric education among those schools. So hopefully better navigators. Uh, you mentioned that uh, patient empowerment. I think communication is really key to that. Uh, my mother's first language is not English, she's Chinese. So, so many times she'll see the doctor and ask him, what did he say? She goes, I have no idea. <laughs> Do you have any advice? Yeah, so the, the question, okay, so what I, well, so I practice at Queens. Okay, so they do have all these interpreter, you know, that they, they have. So if the doc is not just gonna, you know, quickly try to do it, you should insist that you need to have an interpreter service, actually. And they're supposed to provide this. Now, the other challenge here is that we're one of the most diverse community or ethnic and racial, uh, racial diversity here. So, you know, the thing I talk is really a basic stuff, but I do recognize that culturally each of the community or each of the ethnic or racial uh, group have their own values. So uh, even this navigator, if it's, it's better to have somebody who's in your back, same cultural background. So having that navigator is important, but the first is to able to understand what they're saying, right? So, but they do have these, uh, like iPad and, you know, so, so I have seen a couple Chinese patients and they brought, uh, you know, interpreter and then, and then and we communicate. But what happened is sometimes, you know, they're in rush and they say, can you translate type of thing. So that's actually, you know, I don't know the law in Hawaii, but in Texas, okay, we are not allowed to have family member to, uh, to, to translate.
Oh, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, maybe my microphone. Maybe language. I can help you out. I'm the in interpreter, one of the interpreter of uh, my language. So I'm involved with um, Interpreter Language Service Center. So if anyone need any kind, any language interpreter for judiciary code or health related, please contact me. I can help you out. Right. Thank so you certain so much. state in the United States, they demand, it's a law to meet the language need. Uh, so what I don't know here is uh, is a mandatory or not. So do, do you know? I think it is mandatory. Well, it's, so it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. So if you're not offering it, there's something not right about it. Mm -hmm. okay. There's a question from our online audience. Uh, Dr. Ueno, could you speak about patients that may not be mentally capacitated and that may or may not be documented well? Yeah, so that's a you know, competency, right? So that, but uh, always a patient has uh, autonomy and then uh, regardless of their mental capacity, uh, patient comes first. Now, you know, there are more of extreme cases that the, the autonomy is not really not guaranteed and there's no, and that requires a really a careful assessment before we just say that the person can't adjust. But, but we take our, you know, every step. And this is also, there's a legal process that's probably the same thing in Hawaii. There must be some system that allows. So if there's just like hush, you know, if the health side is just like, okay, well, we just don't have time. And then, you know, the family make a decision. That's not right, actually. So you have every right to insist this. And then a health care system is, 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 is have a duty to offer that service to you, actually, yeah. Um, my concern is physician burnout. Yes. And I'm thinking that maybe 20 to 30% of your time, or physician's time is basically note taking for industry with them um, and so forth. I mean, possibly for medication approval and all such that. Can't um, artificial intelligence help with this? Because it's all data based data, so you could um, possibly do something quicker? I'm just thinking that could be a possibility. So the answer is yes, and there is a lot of effort of artificial intelligence incorporated. It will not take over my brain or other people's brain, but you're right, because, um, so we have, so this is not about empowerment, but we have a society that people love to you know, maybe, maybe not in Hawaii, but if you go to like Texas, they love to sue the, the docs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and the problem is that we have to document everything. It takes too much of a time. And this documentation is, you know, goes through this electronic medical record system, which is a terrible EMR system we have. You write something and you don't even know where it's located, actually. So you're right. So there is an effort now to bringing artificial intelligence not to make a decision, but pulls the information for, without for me to you know clicking every pages and 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 I, I think it will make a difference. I mean, there's a lot of things going on from reading of imaging, you know, informations. How can we actually use AI to go to the next level? But it will probably take another five or ten years to reach that stage. Dr. Ueno. To whom do you express concerns when you're having difficulties with your doctor? Um, uh, to whom do you express concerns if a patient is having difficulties with their doctor? <laughs> That's a tough one, yeah. So hospitals should have, whether it's called a patient advocacy system or not, so it shouldn't be that you should be raising the concern to the doctor that you're concerned about it. Mm -hmm. Generally, if you have a concern and if you have a reasonable relationship, it's always good first to bring that up to the person. And if they don't listen, then you go to the staff people or nurses. And if it's still like, sometimes it's really the entire clinic is not functional. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, they, they think it's functional, but they may not be able to be noticing this. Then you're going to have to take it to the next level, which is a patient advocacy group should be uh, addressing this. Um, 
one thing you cannot do is is okay. So I recently had a case that there was an issue with another physician. So I'm the second opinion physician, mm -hmm. and you know they said like you know I I'm I'm concerned about it, and and yeah, and I could understand what you're saying, and you know can you just you know, can you just take me as a patient? And then the answer to that is no, I cannot take a patient because we all have the professional agreement that we don't jump in and take other patients, actually. That you have to remember that. So therefore, what I said is you have to take that first step to reach out that your concern and take these steps so that, and then by taking that, the patient take or the caregiver take a, take an initiative, and that resulted into, um, you know, s severing or whatever change in the physician, that, that's the step you have to take. So really, this step is really important because if you start jumping off the ship and go to another ship without even informing it, and it will have a s very awkward, strained relationship and particularly Hawaii is a small place. Mm -hmm. So if you do something, they will hear this actually, right? So, so that's what I mean by that, you know, Ray, you remember, you are in the driver's seat. You have every right to ask for whatever you want. And, and, but you do have to confront with a healthcare provider. So, so to avoid this kind of thing, it's important from beginning when you see a new doctor, you know, you should say that, you know, I want to learn more, please educate me, you know, I'd like to ask question, you know, what is the best way to ask question, what is the best way to communicate, try to get an agreement with the new docs as much as possible so that you know what you're getting into. So, you know, doctors are also human beings, you know, so. We have time for one last question, if there's another, okay, last question. <laughs> I just wanted to say that several years ago, my mother was at Queens and she was being treated for fever, nausea, etc. And this is right after a stroke. And I just want everybody to know the importance of taking very good notes because my husband and I took turns taking down every medication that she had. And, we, and after doing a lot of research, we found out that she was having her nausea, high fever, after taking the medication Plavix. And so we sat down with the hospitalist and mentioned to him that this is what we have noticed. And we suggested that she get off all the um, IV for um, infection control because they had no idea what was wrong with her, why she could not eat, had nausea, etc. So we took her off all of that, um, um, off Plavix. And right after that, she was getting better. She was eating, her fever went down, and she left the hospital in good shape. So it's so important to be, to have an advocate in the hospital. Correct, yes. So you wanna be your advocate and the caregiver should be advocate of the patient. Uh, just don't caregiver to take over, okay? Autonomy of the patient is always important. But like you just said, documentation is very, very important because you know, you think you communicate it. You think the doc is documenting, but sometimes it's not documented on the our side, and then things get dropped off. And this is what I mean by communication, documentations. Those are all important component, and it makes a big difference in terms of outcome. Actually, yep. So thank you for sharing the story, Dr. Ueno. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk, sure. wonderful you. question and answer session and also for supporting the Mini Medical School. Uh, for all of you, you know, JABSM sponsors the Mini Medical School, but it's in partnership with UH Foundation and the UH Cancer Center, so we really appreciate your support. Great. Okay, mahalo.